Whereas tennis is like, bah! squash is like, ah! badminton is like, ah. Hello. Fresh is the sponsor of today's episode. Oh my God. Go to HelloFresh.com and use my code 12Blaze to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. Oh my God, I love meals. I love stuff for free. You should too. Who wouldn't like that? I mean, thinking about a product that is for everyone. Well, everyone eats <clears throat> and everyone likes stuff when you don't have to pay for it. So that is what HelloFresh is all about. Hello Fresh. link below. More about them in a bit. Holy sh I can barely see my glasses are so dirty. Four times scientists went too far. Danny writes me a script. I shall make it shit by adding some comments and Sam is gonna sprinkle in some fine OGBB memes. Whatever happens to the mad scientists. Whenever I see scientists pop up on the news these days, they've always seemed disappointingly calm and measured and articulate and sensible. Some of them even look as if they might lead a healthy social life, enjoy a pint down the pub with friends and perhaps even pop down to the local badminton club once or twice a week. Oh my God, Danny, you can really read a lot from people's interviews on television. It's like, that guy likes badminton. Danny's like a modern day television based Sherlock Holmes. It's a far cry from the traditional image of a scientist that I used to see in films and TV. They were always tragic, wild haired and wild eyed loners shunned by society and government funding, and even their own peers as they conducted their ethically dubious experiments in the secrecy of a chaotic laboratory hidden away in a remote castle on top of a mountain or in a nuclear bomb shelter or the dining area of a Taco Bell. Did so I don't think, Danny, I think you're just thinking about like scientists in cartoon TV shows and scientists in real life. Like I know some scientists in real life. They're very normal people. They do sciencey shit that I don't understand. So what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on like something to do with the something something. And I'm like, Cool. I was beginning to worry that I've been misled all these years and that the mad scientist never really existed outside of the pages of fiction. Oh no, Danny, they did exist. There was that, that was that Russian dude who's like putting the monkey's head on another monkey's head. He's like stitching two dog's heads onto one dog. <laughs> <laughs> Legend. Oh, smash that dislike button. But a couple of things have since convinced me otherwise. For starters, I know that Simon has a few scientists locked away in neighboring zones of the basement, and they sound like they've gone a bit nutty in their ongoing quest to unlock the secret of immortality. Yeah, but they ain't close, Danny. They soon we won't even need those cryogenic chambers you found. Danny, why do you always make fun of me for wanting to be immortal? <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Who wouldn't want to be immortal? Everyone in the comments, apparently. In the middle of the night, I'm occasionally awoken by the sounds of manic giggling and shrieking, along with screams of, it's alive, and nothing is involved can stop me now. It's nothing in Z, so I assume I'm supposed to do this in a German. If you want me to do a German accent, Danny, just put in square brackets. Anything you put in square brackets, I won't read. It's just how I'm programmed as a fact boy. Oh, I should also read that it's alive, I guess, with uh, more passion. It's alive! Daddy, chill. I hope my neighbors aren't in yet. As I mentioned, a shop opens next door. They open at 11. We've got another hour and a half. I think we're good. They're probably not getting ready for the day just yet. After delving through the history books and back issues of popular mad science, it turns out that the world used to be positively bursting with examples of strange, hairy scientists who got a little too carried away with their own groundbreaking experiments and ended up tossing the badminton club membership card in the bin as they embarked upon a fiercely dedicated journey which would take them to the brink of insanity. Badminton's a weird sport. Like, I never thought really much about badminton. I was forced to play it at school, like every sport that you have to learn. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I get it. It's kind of like lame tennis. And then you occasionally meet people who are extremely into badminton. Like, there's maybe two people I've met in my life, and I don't really remember who they are or where I met them, but they're real. It's not like tennis, where you're like, oh yeah, I play a bit of tennis. And you're like, okay, cool. I play a bit of squash. All right then. And someone's like, no, I'm really into badminton. I go to a badminton club every Saturday. I've got my badminton partners, my team. We destroy all the It's like, whoa, 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 badminton. You mean the one where it's like, ah, ah. Whereas tennis is like, bah! Squash is like, ah! Badminton is like, ah. Oh. But then they go, I've seen them play. I've seen people play competitive badminton and it does get fairly intense. Let's stop talking about badminton. It's a boring sport that I'm only making more boring. Smash that dislike button. Although at the very least, some of them crossed a line and that really won't do at all. Unless that line is the difference between mortality and immortality, Danny, then we all know what the answer to that is. Don't tell anyone else, just share it with your boy. The spill, that was the introduction. Brilliant. I was watching a YouTube video the other day. I mentioned this on my Twitter. You can follow me at Simon Whistler for, uh, probably 
probably not worth it. Yeah, and I, was, I, was, I posted a video I watched of someone saying, like, YouTube introductions should be short, the best YouTubers get to the point immediately, and I was like, yeah, 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 I entirely don't, I mean, I agree, the introductions should be short, and the best YouTubers do get into it immediately. The Spectacular Science Circus. Donating your dead body to medical science is probably the most useful parting gift you can give to the world. So much more worthwhile than just burying the body underground for the sake of ritual. That's not doing anybody any favors unless you're particularly concerned about the well-being of worms. Also, it's not good for the worms either, Danny, because they're pumping your body full of, like, poison and formaldehyde and all of that shit, which will eventually seep into the ground and poison the gra- poison the earth. So, uh, you're doing absolutely no favors for anybody. You should, first of all, decide whether you want to give your body to science or donate your organs. Those are the two options you have. Anything else, eh, you're kind of a bit of a dick, aren't you? And then decide how you, you know, blast into space, buried inside a tree. I don't know, all of these weird things you can do these days. But I suppose, or just get buried or burned. <laughs> Whatever. You're dead. Who cares? But don't forget to be an organ donor. If like one person watches this video and is like, oh yeah, I wasn't an organ donor, and now I am, I would consider this video an extreme success. If it got four views and one person became an organ donor after watching this, I'm just going to tick that box or filling in whatever form you need to do, wherever you are, you could probably do it online. Success. Because loads of people die completely unnecessarily because there's just not enough organs because they're all getting burned. Like, this is insane. What is wrong with our societies? During the rant over. But I suppose it's nice to at least have the option either way. During the 18th and 19th centuries, the bodies of criminals hanged for murder were often donated to medical schools to be spliced up and dissected, whether the guilty party approved or not. Yeah, I'm totally fine with that. You were like executed. Uh, the state's got to get rid of your body somehow. I'd just be like, okay, apply your punishment. We're going to uh, chop your body up. <laughs> okay. I'm totally fine with that. In fact, in England at least, it was decreed to be part of the punishment and it was felt that this would deter criminals from committing illegal acts. I would have thought that getting hanged until dead was quite a powerful deterrent on its own, but apparently back in those days, criminals were equally afraid of getting skinned and carved up afterwards. Some of them were fearful that they might wake up during the procedure, which admittedly would create a, a, a socially awkward moment. Yeah, you could say that again. I'm alive and I'm missing my face. I watched this TV show called Gotham. And it's completely, I don't know if you guys have seen this, it's about like Batman when he's young and shit. And it's quite good. I have to say it's quite a good show. But all of the stakes are completely gone. Because all, I swear, all of the characters have died and come back to life. And now it's like, oh yeah, the main character died. But they haven't really, have they? So they could kill off, you know, someone. I'll just be like, he's coming back. He's coming back at least once. It's happened like five times. What the f***? One such criminal to have been dished out this punishment was a man called George Foster who had been found guilty of murdering both his wife and child in 1803. Not that many criminal bodies were donated to medical science, so there was usually a competitive clamor amongst the medical schools to try and get dibs on the latest criminal cadaver. But in this case, after George Foster was hanged in Newgate, London, his body was delivered to an Italian physicist and physician. Wow, that's a combination. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, a physicist and physician. Do you just want to, like, do it so children don't get confused? <laughs> his name was Giovanni Aldini, and he did something quite unusual to poor dead George. Giovanni was the nephew of acclaimed scientist Luigi Galvani, who had spent much of his time pissing about and applying electricity to dead frogs to see if they started twitching. Young Giovanni had inherited this peculiar interest in electrocuting dead bits of animal, and had also succeeded his uncle in the post of Professor of Physics at the University of Bologna. He later spent much of his time traveling around the laboratories of Europe and putting on macabre carnival-style events in which he enthralled the rapturous crowds by electrocuting the severed heads and bodies of dogs, cows, horses, and sheep. Always remember the past was the worst! It's like, what do people do for entertainment? Well, we're gonna go to this show, and this guy is gonna attach electrodes to a severed head of a dog, and we're gonna watch it do weird shit. Like, in the 1700s, totally normal. In the 20th century, in the 21st century, it's like, that's some you gotta find on the dark web. Whoops of delight and astonishment would echo around this laboratory circus. As the severed animal heads convulsed, jaws began loosely chattering and eyeballs started rolling around in the sockets. One reporter dubbed it Satan's Puppet Show. The only sane man in the room. Everyone else was like, Woo! Yeah, make those eyes roll! <laughs> and one guy's like, you guys are Fucking crazy. <laughs> but what Giovanni really wanted in order to draw in an even bigger crowd was a human corpse. What the f***? I remember when I was a kid there was a, an autopsy on live TV and I was like, bro, what is going on? This is at least 50 years ahead of its time because we all know in like 30 years, YouTube's going to be like, yeah, yeah, no, we're just cool with everything now. <laughs> yeah, it's an autopsy. Go for it. <laughs> it's an ISIS beheading. Sure. It's like, oh my god, YouTube, stop. Uh, he'd already got his hands on the bodies of a few criminals in Bologna who had been sentenced to death, but the problem was that the criminals were decapitated under the region's law and there wasn't anything very interesting he could do with the body, which had been drained of blood and was missing a head. Wait, I thought he could just do it with a head. 
Isn't that, that's gonna draw a crowd, a weird sick crowd. So Giovanni was over the moon when he arrived in London in 1803 and was given the opportunity to take home the freshly hanged body of George Foster, complete with a head and everything. <laughs> Taking it back to Italy, like 200 years ago. It's gonna get smelly, yo. Some suggest that Giovanni had proudly boasted that he could bring George Foster back to life in 1803. Come on. It's more likely that he just wanted to sell tickets for an extra special demonstration of his new electro-stimulation techniques for deceased limbs. Or put another way, he wanted everyone to sit back and lap up the live entertainment as he shoved conducting rods up, rods up the arse of a dead convicted murderer. Ah, oh, the past was the worst! I actually have a t-shirt that says that. This is the boy with the blaze. I think this is actually new. Purchase this at Purchase the Merch Stock. You can also get a t-shirt that says the past was the worst. Sleeper hit. That is very popular. Thank you for purchasing it if you purchased it. Well, it wasn't just up his ass when Giovanni took to the stage or at least showed up at the Royal College of Surgeons in London with his cool new props. He applied the rods to George's rectum, face, chest, legs, and various other parts of the corpse. And then he turned the dial up to 11. Well, at least he didn't take it back to Italy, so it didn't get a chance to get all smelly. In response, the dead body of George convulsed and began to violently punch and kicked the air. The jaw began to quiver, the corpse appeared to take sharp breaths, and at one point George's eye actually popped open, prompting some of the non-medical members of the audience to believe that Giovanni really had mastered the dark art of reimagination. Reanimation. It's a b sh went down at the Royal College of Surgeons. Witchcraft. Of course, it done no such thing. Really, Danny? Thank you. I, I, I believe we'd have been aware if they had a way to raise the dead in 1803. Somebody would be like, Simon, we can raise the dead? It's a conspiracy theory! Shut the f*** up. The corpse fell silence again after George had been unplugged from the mains. <laughs> George Giovanni had demonstrated was the fact that galvanism ex exerted a considerable power over the nervous and muscular systems of the dead body. But it's not entirely clear why Giovanni was devoting so much effort into staging these grisly live adaptations of the worst Thunderbirds ever. I'm just gonna say, possibly could have something to do with money. Maybe he really was motivated by the desire to bring back the dead, or maybe he just enjoyed the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd. Or, or... Money! Uh, either way, he became a respected figure of his time, really. And the Emperor of Austria even honored him with a Knight of the Iron Crown. <laughs> okay. And perhaps Giovanni Aldini's biggest legacy of all was, was that he almost certainly was the inspiration for the Victor character of Victor Frankenstein in Mary Shelley's 1818 novel. Considering the fate that befell the mad scientist Frankenstein in the book, you'd expect that Mary Shelley wasn't entirely an admirer of the real-life flamboyant showman upon whom he was based. And I'm about to expose another area of my complete lack of knowledge of, uh, of anything. So I have no idea what what happened to Frankenstein. I know the scientist was called Frankenstein because it's Frankenstein's monster and everyone thinks that, or some people, maybe not everyone, get confused and think that the monster is called Frankenstein, but it was the scientist. But I have no idea what happened to him. Was he destroyed by the monster? Who knows? That Him being destroyed by his own creation would feel like the correct trope. In fact, maybe that is the origin of the trope. Don't know, but also great news. Don't care. It does make you wonder what would have happened if Giovanni had managed to bring George Foster back to life, though. No, it doesn't, Danny. No one wonders this. It's like obviously impossible. Would the authorities have sent George right back to the gallows to face a second death? Almost certainly, yes. <laughs> would they have had the authority to do that, considering that George had already technically been served a death sentence? No. <laughs> I think this has actually happened, like, in executions in modern times, they failed, or relatively modern times, and the sentence has been carried out again. The problem with reanimation is that you'd probably have to come up with a whole bunch of complicated new laws. The paperwork alone would be a nightmare. Yeah, that's the problem, it's the paperwork. Ah, <laughs> uh, this video, as I mentioned at the beginning, was brought to you by, ah, oh, they're giving away free food! Maybe if you- I don't know what the time is by you now, I don't- I don't actually know how fast HelloFresh deliver. But look, you could- maybe if things work out, just- don't eat until the next HelloFresh arrives, and you won't have to pay for like two days, three days of food. That's actually incredible. Because they give you 12 free meals using the code 12BLAZE. Do you ever find yourself in a recipe rut? I think I've told this story before, but it's like I just end up cooking the same things over and over again because it's been like a really long day at work. I go home and it's like, do I want to look up some new recipe and learn something new? I'll, I'll cook new things on the weekend and then generally bring them in, but it's generally a massive hassle. But not with HelloFresh because they're like, oh look! Look, we send you all of the ingredients in perfectly quantity things. We send you a recipe card. All you have to do is follow it and you have a new meal. I'm like, that's actually brilliant. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a secret. I think I told you this before, but it's that just keep the recipe cards. Like, is it maybe, I mean, you get, it's great to have HelloFresh and they measure all the ingredients, but maybe you're like, I don't know, I didn't order this HelloFresh. You got the recipe card. You can pop to the store and make it again. And you've already learned how. It's fantastic. But HelloFresh is much more convenient because then you don't have to go to the supermarket. You don't have to go to the grocery store because the reality is, like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's cook something tonight. It's like, okay, great. So I go to the butchers, buy some meat, 
go to the grocery store, get some vegetables. Get, get everything you need in this. Oh, it's taken me like an hour. <laughs> I've still got to cook it. Hello Fresh are like, none of that bullshit. None of it. Oh no, I've never actually tasted Hello Fresh. <laughs> you might be like, Simon, what are you talking about? You've just been raving about it for 10 minutes. It's like, yeah, I know. I've just been raving about the benefits that have risen out for me. Because <laughs> I don't live in a country where I can get Hello Fresh, which is pretty sad because I would be all over this shit. But David, who I do the Today Fan Out channel with, he, I was like, dude, can I ship this to you? Do you want it? And he's like, do I want it? Do I, do I ever? And he was like, Simon, it's amazing. He even shot me some video, which you probably watched in this little clip thing. That's not me. But yeah, he said it's tasty and delicious. Go to HelloFresh.com and use my code 12Blaze to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. Repeat CTA. Go to HelloFresh.com and use my code 12Blaze to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. Add scientists on acid. By all accounts, the American chemist and spy master Sidney Gottlieb was a polite and gentle and mild-mannered chap with a heart of gold and a love of what? Folk dancing. Yes, I cannot lie. But it can be tricky to square this image of Sidney with the guy who also dedicated a big chunk of his life to the potential control of the human mind with LSD. Oh, sh it. And he allegedly didn't always ask for permission from his guinea pig volunteers. Dude, it's like not cool. It's like cool activities. Drug trip. Terrible activities. Unintentional drug trip. Back in the 1950s, the US was concerned that the Soviet Union had conquered the secrets of mind control. Spoiler alert, they hadn't. This obviously wasn't true, as the communists were far too busy enlarging the foreheads of children and getting them to crash flying saucers over Roswell in a bid to convince the Americans that the aliens were coming OGBB. But that didn't stop the US from considering a counterattack on the mind control front. Sidney had been working for the CIA as a poison expert in the chemical division, and in 1953 he was asked to head up the new project MKUltra, which I once pronounced McUltra. <laughs> Everyone was like, ah, why is that? A new burger from McDonald's, Simon. <laughs> you absolute amateur. The goal of the project was to investigate techniques that would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit anything. One of the first things that Sidney did was blow $24,000 of his budget, snapping up the world's entire supply of LSD so that he could monitor the potential controlling effects of this hallucinogenic drug on volunteers of the program. Dude, oh my god, dude, in the 1950s, $24,000? That's got to be like a quarter million each a day, easy. That is going to buy you a lot of LSD. To begin with, the CIA largely experimented only on themselves. <laughs> he was having a great time. After a heavy night tripping, Sidney reflected on how he was uh, in a kind of transparent sausage skin that covers my whole body. Sidney, you are doing the Lord's work. Meanwhile, following the results of the initial experiments, the CIA's Office of Security issued a thoughtful memo which stated that it did not recommend testing LSD in the Christmas punch bowls usually present at office parties. Is that real? <laughs> Holy sh the CIA was up to some good times. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah, we're taking over South American countries and doing acid. Woo! CIA! CIA! That's what their office parties were like. True story. As the project expanded, a bunch of willing volunteers came forward to offer their services and assessing the qualities of LSD handouts, including a few names who would later become well-known, such as Robert Hunter, the lyricist for The Rock Band, The Grateful Dead, and Ken Kissy, author of the classic novel One Flew Over the Cookie's Nest, which itself would examine the themes of authoritarian control of individuals through subtle and manipulative tactics. Never read it, never seen the movie. But things took a more sinister... I don't think I've ever heard... I don't think I've ever listened to The Grateful Dead. But things took a more sinister step in later years when the drug was administered to people who hadn't really agreed to sign on the perforated line. It's, it's important to note that nearly all of the McCultra records were destroyed following the closure of the program in the 1970s, and it's not like we have a well-documented diary of the illegal events that took place over the course of nearly two decades. But by piercing together fragments of surviving material, it becomes blatantly obvious that the project crossed several lines, including some of Sydney's dodgy experiments with LSD. The project sourced fresh batches of volunteers from prisoners in detention centers around Europe, Japan, and the Philippines. Holy sh guys. What are you doing? This is not allowed. Where there was less p pesky red tape or legal repercussions. <laughs> Dudes. But they were happy to conduct experiments on unwitting citizens on home soil too. A string of brothels were set up in San Francisco, which were secretly operated by the CIA. Prostitutes were encouraged to lace the cocktails of clients with LSD so that the results could be mo monitored by the CIA via two-way mirrors. This is so insane. This part of the project was given the sweet code name of Operation Midnight Climax. <laughs> I've made a video about this before. I've made, probably made more than one video about this before. It's worth bearing in mind that Sydney and his team were breaching the very same standards that they that saw the convictions and executions of Nazi doctors in the Nuremberg trials just a decade or two later. Ah, uh, very same standards that saw the convictions? 
I mean, I don't want to make light of what, you know, McUltra and the dude scientist was up to. But this wasn't Auschwitz, yo. <laughs> it's like, what happens? Yeah, yeah, they went to a brothel and they did LSD and we watched them. Auschwitz, what did you do? Well, I tortured this twin in this one room to see if this other twin reacted. Oh yeah, no, they were both children. Yeah, what happened to their family? Oh, they were all murdered. Oh. Oh. Different. Very different. Still, maybe spiking the drinks of hundreds of innocent citizens around the world with LSD yielded some fruitful results for the CIA. Spoiler alert, probably not. Nah, not really. It was just a very long and bad trip with a come down that lasted for years. Although Sidney was initially hopeful that LSD contained the secret that was going to unlock the universe, he later concluded that the whole thing had been a complete waste of time and mind control was not even remotely possible. <laughs> Possibly repenting for his past deeds, Sidney spent the last years of his life running a leper hospital, raising goats, folk dancing, eating yogurt, and advocating for peace and environmentalism. I feel like that's just gonna happen to me one day. It's gonna be like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm just gonna lose it. I make so many videos, like my life is a never-ending stream of like insanity, and I'm just one day just gonna be like, F it, I'm F it, no more videos. I'm gonna go raise goats and eat yogurts. Where's the yogurt coming? It's from the goats. Oh. It sounds a bit like the man who is often known by the nicknames of the Black Sorcerer and the Dirty Strickster in his career heyday eventually consumed so much LSD that he turned into a hippie. Hippies, they're everywhere. They want to save the earth, but all they do is smoke pot and smell bad. Yep. Ironically, all Sydney had really achieved via his mind control experiments was to introduce LSD to the USA by snapping up the entire global supply. Legend. Along the way, he became the accidental sponsor of the rebellious LSD counterculture, which was dedicated to tearing down the government and the very agency the city worked for. And that's some really heavy shit to deal with. The scales. Of eternity. Considering the vast number of universal mysteries that have so far eluded the grasp of mankind, it seems to me that some scientists waste their time getting bogged down with entirely the wrong questions. For example, in 1901, Dr. Duncan McDougall, great name, <laughs> McDougall, spent a considerable chunk of his time trying to discover the answer to that old chestnut that always comes up in discussions around the pub table. How much does the human soul weigh? Nothing, because it's not real! For fuck's sake. And in case you're curious, the answer is allegedly 21.3 grams. Isn't there a movie called 21 grams or something? I know this story. This was some guy who, he put people on a big weighing scales, and when they died, he was like, oh my god, 21.3 grams left your body, and then it turned out there was a big a spoiler alert. I'm just gonna stop because Danny's about to tell this story and I've already spoiled it, haven't I? Although if you're watching this channel and you believe in souls... Hand it over, that thing, your dark soul. Do you like me insulting you? Do you like me insulting your beliefs? Weird. Get out of here. Smash that dislike button. Born in Glasgow, Duncan Glasgow. Uh, Duncan moved to Massachusetts in 1888 to pursue a career as a physician, and he later became intrigued by the idea that the human soul must surely have some sort of mass and could therefore, in theory, be weighed. So his plan was so silly. His plan was to gather up a group of dying human patients and then weigh them during the final moments on Earth so that he could see exactly how much weight they'd lost after death, thus revealing the definitive weight of the human soul. But that raises the bigger question. Does a fat person have a bigger soul? The answer is... No, they don't have any soul at all. <laughs> he set up shop at the Coolest Consumptives Home in the town of Roxbury in Boston, and somehow convinced a group of dying patients to choose a giant industrial weighing scale as their deathbed. It was important that the patients were suffering from extreme physical exhaustion, as Dr. Duncan didn't want them wriggling about all over the place while he was trying to accurately weigh them. The owners of the care home did occasionally express reservations about the project, as did many religious and scientific critics of the experiments, who grew concerned about the potential implications of proving that the soul was a very physical manner. Manifestation. The scientists are not concerned. The scientists shouldn't be concerned. If you're a proper scientist, you'll be like, okay, go ahead. And if you do find that 21.3 grams escapes from the human body, we're going to be on that shit and trying to replicate it and figure out how and why and what it is and if it is actually a soul, because that's what science is. The religious people just be like, it was the soul. He showed it was the soul. <laughs> Like, no, please stop. Please stop believing in things without any evidence whatsoever. And don't get me like don't don't get me confused. I'm not some sort of like crazy atheist. I don't necessarily not believe that there is some higher power that we don't understand. In fact, I, I think it'd be quite arrogant to think that this is it. But also, we're not going to be f***ing measuring the escaping soul from a body, just like we're not going to find whatever that higher power is in a church or a mosque or a synagogue or any place of worship. It's 
it's just all a bit silly. It's it's arrogant to think that there's nothing else out there, but it's also arrogant to think that, yeah, yeah, we built a pointy building. That's how. Both are equally arrogant. Oh my god, everyone's gonna be smashing the dislike button right now. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> it's like I've just offended everybody, except for the tiny percentage of the population who believe exactly the same thing I do. With Albo the Doctors, Duncan apparently spent five years on the experiment, which is surprising as he actually only got round to weighing a total of just six terminally ill patients in their time, two of which <laughs> lazy, am I right? Uh, two of which were immediately discounted because of technical problems with the scales. Oh my god, double lazy. The Dr. McDougall, come on! You're living up to your net. McDougall just makes someone sound silly. It's like surnames, like McDougal. You sound like some nickname someone would give a dog. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's my dog. His name's Duncan. But we call him Mr. McDougal. A crushing blow? Yes. Will I get over it? Mm. No. But life goes on. Not for me. After factoring losses of body fluids and gases and skin moisture, Duncan concluded in 1907, in a 1907 hypothesis concerning soul substance together with experimental evidence of the existence of such substance. Dude, that was an unnecessarily wordy title. Like, if one of my writers delivered that to me, I'd be like, bro, you fluffing it out to hit the word count or what? <laughs> uh, that human soul weighed 21.3 grams as one of the four remaining patients was deemed to have lost this exact amount after shuffling off his mortal coal. So we're brilliant, we got a sample size of one. Hero! For an encore, Dr. Duncan. Let's call him by his proper name, Danny. For an encore, Dr. McDougall performed a similar experiment on 15 dying dogs, reasoning that dogs don't have souls, so their weight should stay the same after death. Backing up his point that it was exclusively the human soul that weighed just over 21 grams, he was right on this point, as another 15 dogs showed any unexplained weight loss after death. Okay, so that, that doesn't prove the human thing. That doesn't add to your sample size of one. It just shows that dogs don't have anything magically leaving their body after death. Good lord, science in the past was a joke. I'm just quite worried about where he happened to find 15 terminally ill dogs. It's widely believed that he couldn't, so he just found 15 perfectly healthy dogs and poisoned them. Yeah, a dude in, 19, in 1888 is gonna be like, yeah, I found terminally ill dogs. What, you, like testing them for like cancer and heart disease and stuff? So like, no, no, it's 1888. We just take the dogs, we steal them, or we breed them specifically for it, and we just kill them with poison. Some people believe he just killed them. Obviously he just killed them! There are many flaws with Dr. McDougall's hypothesis. Surprise! Uh, the sample size was ridiculously small. It would have been difficult to determine the exact second of death in 1901, and the equipment used wouldn't have been entirely accurate in assessing such precise weight changes. More significantly, he completely ignored the results of the other three human patients who witnessed no change at all in weight, choosing instead to focus on the single patient who did, even though this was probably due to a cock-up with measuring techniques or a miscalculation of other factors. Hmm. Shocking. The study was ultimately dismissed as selective reporting with zero scientific merits. Dr. Duncan was last seen attempting to take photographs of the human soul leaving the body, but he died before he could get the pictures developed at Boots. I don't think it was necessary to allegedly poison 15 dogs to try and prove a point that really didn't need making. Besides, it's common knowledge that dogs are approximately 10 times more soulful than humans anyway. Danny, no! The gift of gonorrhea. Oh my. Back in 1895, a pediatrician from New York City by the name of Henry Hyman was exploring the murky world of gonorrhea. Dirty mother. I gather that gonorrhea, often quite sweetly known as the clap, although nobody really agrees why, is... Wait, I thought there was a reason why it was called the clap. I really thought I knew the reason behind that, but now I realise I don't. I'm gonorrhea, and that's a fact. If you can say that, then call me clap. <laughs> Uh, is a remarkably painful STD that usually involves messy discharges and the unwelcome sensation of feeling as if your genitals have been set on fire. Holy sh**. <laughs> Sendry was keen to investigate the agents of this nasty disease to see if gonorrhea spreads like a germ. Oh my. Of course, he ideally needed to work with some volunteer patients who were allegedly already su who were already suffering from the disease. But he couldn't find any of those, so he just collared a patient suffering from the final stages of tuberculosis along with two young kids. Dude, what are you up to? No. Henry then stuck samples of gonorrhea onto the end of a few sticks and poked his victims in the eyes with them. Dude, no! Instantly delivering a big dollop of clap into their bodies. The good news is that gonorrhea isn't fatal, so the victims were likely to recover after undergoing the seemingly relentless burning agony of the disease. Ah, so you're gathering children together and torturing them. Excellent. 
And don't worry too much about the kids. One who was a 16 and one was just four years old. According to Henry, both the kids had it coming anyway. In his own personal journal, he noted that the 16-year-old was an idiot with chronic leprosy, while the four-year-old was simply an idiot. It's not clear if the experiments provided any notable results, but it does seem quite barbaric that Henry was purposefully infecting such young patients, presumably with learning disabilities, which is what I gather from his less than eloquent notes, when there wasn't even a truly effective cure for gonorrhea at the time, apart from crappy herbs and minerals and voodoo patent medicine. Well, maybe they got some cocaine out of it. I mean, at the very least, they could get some cocaine, some heroin. Still, if those kids have enough, had enough patience, they'd only hang around for another 50 years or so with the proper cure uh, during the golden age of antibiotics. Thank goodness this kind of experiment was incredibly rare and largely confined to the 19th century. <laughs> Danny, no, it wasn't. It definitely wasn't. Uh, except, of course, it wasn't. <laughs> All sorts of horrific shit happened in the 20th century. Right up until the 1970s, scientists and doctors across the US were infecting children with tuberculin, infecting prisoners with syphilis, infecting 12-year-month-old babies with herpes, and infecting Jewish patients in a Brooklyn hospital with live cancer cells. And that's barely the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, the, um, the Tuskegee experiment is something I made a video on, and that is shockingly recent and just absolutely shocking. It seems that even the more enlightened 20th century was... Oh, that was... Yeah, there's the... 20th century. Oh yeah, okay, I understand. Sorry, Danny. Sorry, I'm stupid. Uh, like the 20th century was rife with real-life mad scientists who went way, way too far, but thankfully, they're more of a dying breed these days. Let's just hope that nobody discovers a way to bring them back to life! But a boom boom Maybe you can just make their dead jaws wobble a bit. Oh, that's all right for a laugh. Thank you, everybody, for watching this video, if you did like it. Also, if you want some merch, perch the merch.co. And thank you for watching. CIA! CIA! <laughs>